father had had. Uh, we all have different fatherhoods, haven't we? Some good, some bad times. But today, I just want to share, and this isn't going to be that long, uh, but it's called The Believing Father. Dads be there. Dads be there. And I had a dad that was, uh, he ran bars and restaurants in the early days of my life. Uh, then he became a cop. Uh, my grandfather was a cop, so I got to be a part of that lifestyle, learned how to shoot guns at early ages. Uh, and uh, don't let somebody tell you that we, we need to take away your gun. It's not safe. Don't, don't let somebody do that. It's a right we have, and I'm thankful for people that can protect us, like in schools and so forth. Uh, I was glad for my upbringing in that and learning how to shoot. But I just want to say this. The biggest thing that happened to me in my life was when somebody believed in me. Come on. Your heavenly father believes in you. Right? The power of a believing father has so much effect on our life. There, there was something about when we're believed in by a father. It empowers us. It empowers us to do everything that we couldn't normally do. I remember I had my earthly father, then I got out, started doing goofy stuff when I became a teenager. I ran into a guy just right down here that had an amusement type business with pinball machines and foosball. And so he was my boss, so he kind of was that father figure for a while. Okay? There was some good and bad in that. The bad part was he had drugs that I helped him sell. The good part was he embraced me and he took me to places like his lake place and we skied. And I can still remember we were on this boat. I had my hands on. We were, I was skiing and he said we're going to go to Bagnell Dam, which was about 10, 12 miles. And so I'm riding on that and I'm thinking in my mind, oh man, it would be easier to let go and relax. This is getting a long time here doing this. And I can remember hearing him say, Boy, Cap was short for Capra. Cap's tough. I think he's going to make it. Something on the inside of me rose up, and I grabbed that, and I, I, I'm going to make it. I made it all the way to the dam on the skis. Now, there's something about when somebody believes in you, and somebody speaks to you, and somebody says you can do it. Come on, something happens on the inside. There was a God-given power in us when we're believed in, and so when earthly people speak it to you. It's, it just whoo, breaks it open and gets started. You know, so how many know that there's children out there waiting, there's people out there waiting for you to speak life to them, waiting for you to speak encouragement? Children in minority neighborhoods, 74% don't have fathers at home. How many know the biggest part of our problems with our, it's going on out there, gangs, where they were fatherless children? They just weren't around. And the things that I've started to see happen, I was mentioning this to them, there is a group that, in a school, and they said, hey, dads, let's get together and let's take turns with groups of us hanging out in the schools. You know, the violence rate went down to almost zero. I mean, these kids saw their dad in there or different dads, and they didn't do anything. And these dads didn't have to do a whole lot. Their just presence was there that changed this. Children need love and encouragement of a father, someone to believe in them. I, I do want to, uh, the power of believing, Mark 9, 22, does it say some things are possible when you believe? All? Todo? Come on. All things. And, and then, uh, then I get this little twist on this. I'm not trying to change scripture, but kind of a, the Dennis version here. All things are possible when you believe or someone believes in you. See, your believing is tied into God saying you can do it. All things are possible when you believe. When you believe that I have released my power that I put on the inside of you when you receive Jesus, when you believe you have that because he believes in you. I was so blessed to have Dave Duell in my life when we first started the church, every time we'd be challenged, he said, brother, go for it. You could do it. And when he believed in me, I believed in me. 
How many know that no matter, any, no matter how bad you were put down, how many people told you you couldn't do it, God was always there saying you can do it. All things are possible. Uh, it was so good if you get a chance, watch Lisa's testimony from the women's conference. Uh, she's sharing her story about her two children that she had to give up for adoption. And she had a family that kind of made her the black sheep of the family. But she stood and believed God, and God restored both of her children back to her that she had given away for adoption. And, I mean, you, I can't tell you all the story, but go to YouTube. It's our channel. Our channel, Faith Ministries. Capra Ministries. Capra Ministries channel. And watch these women's testimonies. Check out what Lise had to say. It's powerful testimony about restoration. You know, when you look at Lise, you see this confident young girl, but her parents kind of put her down. She knows Jesus. She's got his believing in her. Come on, when we don't have it. But my believing is in him believing in me, and that his power works in me and through me. How many here believe his power works in you and through you? God is waiting for you to take a chance and, and at the lady at the line at the grocery store that's having trouble making it to the counter, and you say, hey, is it okay? Can I pray for you? God is waiting to say, go for it. Some of us think God's getting nervous when we go to pray for somebody that needs a healing. <laughs> oh, don't, don't lay hands on this one. I don't know if I can do this one. The power is always on from heaven. And it flows through you. Yes. Come on now. 2.20 of Galatians. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. No, not I, but... Christ lives in me. Come on, for the life I now live, I live by the... You living by your faith? No. You're living by the faith of the Son of God. How many know this isn't your deal? It's all about Him and it's His faith. It's not something you've got to work up and make happen. He's given it to you. Just those words keep ringing. When Dave do, I would say, Dennis, go for it. You can do. All the way down to my first deliverance. England. 1992, they're praying for people. And this English lady prays for her and she goes down in the spirit, whatever you want to call it. And she starts manifesting. Legs start to levitate off the ground. And I'm like, what's Dave going to do? He goes, there you go, son. Have at it. My first deliverance right there, man. How many know somebody believes in you, you can do it, you can do it? Come on. Yes, Lord. Bonnie said to me last week, you have his anointing. I've got Jesus' anointing, but I know what she was talking about. I have Jesus' anointing in my personality. See, here, here's how it works. Jesus' anointing is in you. His power is in you. And even though there's a lot of different people that pray different ways, he's going to do it according to your personality. So, so don't expect to act like this person or that person that flows in that. You know, I think, well, this is how he would chop and blow if I do it just like he does. No. You're anointing. God's given you your own anointing to flow and how you flow. Come on. Uh, I have Jesus' anointing in my personality. You can do it, son, versus you worthless, and you can't do it. How many of you were told you couldn't do it? A couple of you? Yeah. Come on. How many, we all know of Andrew Womack's ministry, and some of us know of Don Crow, who was a guy that's been with Andrew for a long time. And Andrew did, uh, or Don did a lot of the ministry, a lot of the uh, life for the day uh, commentary that you see. Don put a lot of that together. But Don had a dad, and they'd get working on the car, and the dad would always say, don't strip it. You know, when you put a bolt in, you got to be careful not to strip it. And Don was so afraid of stripping it, guess what he did? He put the bolt in and out, and he kept putting it in and out because he was afraid of stripping it until he stripped it. So he would overcompensate because that was on the inside of him. Now, Jesus tells us two, three parables, and this is in... Luke chapter 15, starting at 11. And the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost 
son that we know of as the parable of the prodigal son were, were right there in a row. And these three parables are a subject of recovering the lost. I don't know what you've lost or haven't lost, but God wants you to restore it. He wants to restore it back to you, whether it's relationships that you've lost. Well, I've seen, you know, Rick was telling us about the relationship with his brother, the things that God restored. His father uh, that was an alcoholic as he grew up. You know, his dad's a pastor now. How many know God can restore things that we've messed up? Come on. So they talk about the loss, which was... Uh, implicit explanation to the Pharisees of why Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. Hey, don't ever give somebody a hard time when they're eating with somebody that might not be the upper echelon of society. You know, I get to watch Kim Saleh so often, and after church, you know, we, we've got people talking with people. Kim looks for those people that need ministry. She finds them. She gets them back in the corner. Not, not corners them, but she gets them back there, and she's ministering to these people that are really going through a hard time. I know she loves me saying these things about her, but she's a birthday girl. She's a birthday girl. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I, I remember uh, a church we were at in India, Sylvie Katapali from India. And we were there, and this church is full, big, beautiful marble church that he believed God, and this guy came in and helped him build this church. And most of it's women, but there's still a lot of men there. And the women, they're all sitting on the ground on this marble floor, some of them mats, beautiful clothing. And I remember telling them this story about a guy coming in the back door drunk. And how when they gave this altar call, uh, for people to get saved and healed, I said, God healed this drunken guy. And they all started going like this to me. No, 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 no. I said, Sylvia, are they telling me no? He goes, yes, they are. See, because in their culture, you had to get it right before you came to church. How many would not even be church now if you had to get it right before you came to church? Where Jesus accepts us the way that we are and then works on us and changes us, right? Right? So we had to start 101 the gospel with this group of people right off the bat. How many know self-righteousness doesn't get you anywhere? But God's righteousness does. Come on. Uh, see, God does a little different. See, the law demands, doesn't it? The law demands your perfection. Grace supplies. The law demands righteousness. And grace supplies righteousness. The law says, your sin demands punishment. Grace says, I remember your sins no more. Which side do you want to work on in this equation? Are you want to be on the side of grace? Or you still want to operate in the law as good as you can do? See, the prodigal means, basically, it's wasteful. Particularly when it regard to money. We don't know the age of this young Jewish man, but you want to change a nation, but you can't serve your local body, it won't happen. I mean, we need to start what we have is what we've got. Now, I'm going to start reading the prodigal son, and we're going to break it down a little bit. Verse 11 says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my portion of goods that falls to me. So he, how many of you did that to your father and he went to the bank and got all the money? That didn't, didn't happen for me, but we're getting to see this. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son had gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land and began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. Now get this, Jewish boy feeding pigs. I mean, that was probably the lowest of the low that you can go on that scale. And then it said, and 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods the swine ate. 
but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, oh Jesus, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish here with hunger? Now I wanna say something to you. This is what we've gotta be believing for when he came to himself. I'm believing that what's going on in the United States right now with all the crooked things that are going on, the crooked people, the people that have brought the fraud in, I believe they're having one of these moments and they're coming to themselves and they're humbling themselves and saying, God, I've been blind, but now I see. See, there's, there's people out there that have come to the light, if you will. Have you ever been taken so down in your current situation, it was so bad, it couldn't get any worse, that all of a sudden you hit bottom and the only place you could look was up? That's happening in our nation right now. People are coming to the end of themselves. And he said, I will rise and go to my father and say, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. See, you see a little humility there? Is he coming back saying, hey, I want my place back as your son over all these slaves? No, humility it hit. How many know when we approach God, we need to be approaching him humbly? And how does he respond? Do you ever go to God and tell him what he owes you? Do you ever have that victim mentality? Because see, our world right now is trying to get people into the victim mind mentality. They owe you. Entitlement, they call it. Come on. That's not the way God rolls. Come on. That's... And then he goes on here to say, I will rise and go to my father and say, I have sinned against heaven and before you and not worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had he, t he turned his arms and he said, oh, you're the one that took the money and ran. I'm going to make, I'm going to make you suffer for a while. Is that what the father did? Come on. Can you imagine father daily looking for his son to come home, waiting for that day when his son would come home? And the father said to the servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it that we may be eat and be merry. Now, did the father spare anything for the son that was lost and now is found? You know, I, I remember, you know, through the different parts of the years in this church, I would see different people that hadn't been in the church for a long time. Maybe they'd, they'd gone, what, what's that? Oh, my fatted calf. Come on, we got a fatted calf here now. That's what we're talking about. And, and so I would see people that I hadn't seen in church in years, and I'd heard some stories about them, you know, falling off and going the way of sin in their life and so forth. And, and here's how they think. I'm going to start on the back row. So you guys on the back row, don't feel like anybody's staring at you. Uh, but they would come in to the back row, and they'd kind of look around. How are these people going to treat me? I've come back to God, I've come back to church, but I'm going to get on the back row and just see how, stick my neck out there and see how they're going to, if they're going to cut it off or not. And silly, Sister Sally Sandpaper kind of looks back and like, uh-huh, uh-huh. But we got rid of Sister Sally Sandpaper. You, are you hearing what I'm saying? Because we love people when they come back to God. And they were lost and now they're found. Are you, are you hearing me, what I'm saying? And then he says, for this is my son that was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And he began, they began to be merry. Now, here's what we don't want to be. We don't want to be, number, verse 25. Now, the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house because he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, and he asked uh, what, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he was received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf, but he was angry and would not go in. Now, I want to say a couple things to you. First, I want to start breaking this down. 
you know, out of verse 12 and 13, sons must be allowed to live their lives. How many know you must give somebody the opportunity to sin or live righteously? You know, that's what God did to us. And we've got to find out, man, that this is not a forced thing. We are not robots. God gives you that opportunity to do that. Come on. You know, to sin or, uh, or to walk in the righteousness is our choice, your choice, their choice. And God gives us that free will choice. Uh, experience can teach. How many know that the experience taught that son that went out into the world and lived in those parties? Yeah, but if it doesn't kill you first, that's all what every mother is, is uh, concerned. Experience, experience can teach, but God's way is the word being established in our heart. How many know that's a better way? Is getting established in the word of God. Right now, our schools are trying to draw our kids away to a living of every kind. I mean, does it freak you out that they're trying to bring in... Uh, not only lesbianism, but they're, pardon? Transgenderism. They're trying to bring these all in to our kids below kindergarten age. And so we're seeing some people stand up and say, not in my state, like the state of Florida. Not my town, where are we doing that? See, these things have to be stopped because these children are so vulnerable. They're saying, hey, we're not letting you buy a gun until you're 21, but we're going to give you drugs as three-year-olds until you figure out if you're a boy or a girl. Come on now, that's, it's got to stop. It's got to, no more, come on. But the famine hit. How many know that two and a half years ago, the pandemic happened? And they were trying to get us all in. They were trying to shut our churches down. And they did in most cases. Some of us said, hey, wait a minute. What are they doing here? We had to wear masks so you couldn't sing, couldn't worship God. They were trying to bust our economy. They're still trying to do that right now. Are you getting that? They're trying to bust it. But how many know that God showed his faithfulness through that time greater than we'd ever seen before? Didn't lack one thing in those times, in those hours. But the famine hit, and we just had self-induced famine happen. But those who trusted in the Lord were abundantly taken care of. What we are in right now, you stay in faith, and you expect yourself and everybody you're connected to to be abundantly taken care of. They raise the gas prices, and God's going to give me more to buy gas. Whatever's going on, God's going to supply some of our needs according to his riches and glory. My God shall supply some of my needs. What does it say? All my needs according to the economy. According to his riches and glory, are you out there? I, I hope we're shaking you a little bit because it's time to stand. It's, it's not time to, oh, okay, we, we better do what they tell us. No, it's, it, when it goes against the word of God, you need to stand up. And speak. Don, you don't have a problem standing up, do you? <laughs> don't want to tell me that. Come on. But so what we've got to see here is when your pain happens, things happen like that. But when your pain supersedes your logic, come on. See, we, this isn't a logical time. This is a time of the spirit. See, it's time of the Spirit. It's not something for we to be figuring out in our own understanding. It's time for saying, Holy Ghost, what are we going to do here? This was set up so you can't figure it out, and you have to follow God, and we're watching God come through in this hour, in this time. Then it talked about verse 3. Or this wasn't verse 3, but this is my third note. When you are in your own pride, humble yourself. How, how many knows that it took that boy having to starve and wanting to eat what the pigs were eating? It's called pride. But humble yourself. Go home to your father. Swallow your pride and embarrassment. If you don't have the circumstances, uh, if you don't, 
the circumstances will humble you. How many would rather humble themselves or have the circumstances humble us? Come on now. It's time. It's our turn now. In the case of the boy feeding the pigs, right? Uh, that's about as humble as you can get. But don't let that have to go to that point of having eaten what the pigs are eating. Don't go there. You don't have to. We can go home to our father. See, and this is where we were singing that song, Abby. He's a good, good father. Are you quoting it? Are you saying it? Are you reminding yourself that God's a good father? That God is not holding back anything from you. Our sister needs a healing. She came here needing a healing. God has healed you in Jesus' name. And don't ever think that God's holding back. Jesus took our sickness, our disease, our sins 2,000 years ago. It was finished then. Now it's about us getting our heart to fully persuaded to believe what God has done is mine and it's mine now. How many know God's already blessed you? Come on. But he came to himself, even my father's servants have enough to spare. Fathers must speak over their children, their calling, not their falling. You know, I don't know about you, but I did some knucklehead things. And my dad, what is wrong with you? Can't you? You know, we need to be making our kids responsible for what they're doing. But we need to be speaking daily their calling, their anointing, what God has told them to do. You know, we got a lot of people, and I, I know knew several of them, that they had a few feminine characteristics and their dad started calling them queer, gay. And guess what? They became what their fathers called them. So what do you want your child to become? You need to start speaking it. Speak life, oh. Speak and say over them. Even if they're doing dumb things, speak the opposite over them. Come on, it's quiet. Amen. See, when you are in your own pride, humble yourself. Go home. Swallow it. Get rid of it. Come on. Uh, he went home. Had his speech prepared, expected to be a servant, but God. Everybody say, but God. but God. You know, it's okay to humble yourself. But when you're working with the Father, he's trying to get you to experience what he's called you to be. You are anointed. You are called for this time in history. Our turn right now. The Father saw him coming. From a long way off, as, as if he'd been waiting for him all this time. Can you, do you know the Father is waiting for you? If you're out there, man, he's waiting for you to come home. He's looking for you. See, the church people who have run off coming back, they're afraid to come back in the church because are we going to treat them that same way? Man, I'm so glad you came back. Man, I love you. Man. I, you know, a lot of, I saw this analogy the other day, and they showed these churches and people messing up over here, and this guy over here on his phone, and, and the ushers coming by and saying, get off that phone. You know, we're going to have to kick you out if you can't act right, be right. And, and so these people that come in, the church treats them worse than if they go down to the local bar. The guy knocks his beer off the table, and, and he's kind of freaked out that he didn't say, oh, sir, it's okay, we'll clean it up for you and get you another one. See, sometimes the world treats people better than the church. So where were we at? Come on. So I haven't seen that guy in a while. Just hug him. So glad that you came in, right? So he was a long way off, and he, and his, uh, and he ran to his son. 
church people who have run off coming back. We, we want them to run. We want to run to them. Welcome. So glad to have you back. And then he restored the robe. I don't care how you feel, what you did. You have been given the robe of righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I don't care how you feel or what you did. You are the restore. God has restored you to righteousness. He put a ring on your finger. You, you know, when he gave this guy this ring, it was Visa Gold, Visa Platinum. It was saying, you're back in the house. You stamp anything that comes into this house. You order it. You stamp it. It's paid for. You know, you are technically wearing God's ring, and he's wanting you to go... You know, Nate has to raise money for these trips. It's cost a lot of money and equipment and all that kind of thing. But God has put his ring on his finger. And he's made, you need that? Okay, we're going to get it. We're going to get it paid for. We're going to take taken care of. I could probably ask him, have you ever not had enough, Nate, on these trips? Have you ever not had enough or has God supplied? What? Sometimes it looks a little scary, but we got the ring. You got the ring. Can you see yourself? Better than Visa Platinum. Are you with me? You have full rights of the family back. Sandals. Come on. Gospel of good news. Blessed are the feet of those who preach the good news, the gospel. Put sandals on his feet. He separated him from the, the, the real servants that were there to sonship. That he'd had. He'd restored. It also represents firm footing. You've got firm footing. You've got a position to stand and preach the gospel. Come on now. And then he brought out this fatted calf. Break it down. We got a picture of that boy again. Feasting. Celebration. You were dead. Now you're alive. We need to be celebrating those that have been delivered. Those that have come back are sons and bring them back in the fold. Yes. You know, the years I got to travel with Dave, I messed up and he talked to me about it a few times, but he was always that loving father that welcomed me back, that got me right back in the saddle again, praying for people, ministering to people. But here's what we don't want to be. We don't want to be that religious older brother. Those are people that are under the law. Waiting to condemn you. Self-righteous. If you feel yourself, you know, I know what that guy's been doing. And I've been reading my Bible all week. And I've been doing every righteous thing I know. Praying, fasting. Man, get ready for a fall. Do you know that? Pride comes before fall. And when you bless somebody, they just come back. It's been brought in. You give them that fatherly hug, man. You are being set up. You know, Denise is very good at this. She is happy when people are blessed. Somebody gets a new car. Oh, look at that new car you got. So blessed. And, and you know, some people are looking like, mm-hmm, I uh, see that. <laughs> Women walk in, just got a new dress, and you can see those ladies looking up and down. Yeah. Uh-huh. Man, be happy for people that God is blessed. Are you with me? Oh, man, that's so awesome. Look what God did for you. Come on now. See, don't be like those Pharisees. And and it's the last that I want to give to you here. The fathers of our nation must be led by the Holy Spirit daily. And we are raising up fathers to the nation. Come on. We're raising them up. Now we are to be fathers to the nations. You know, Nate's being a father to Zambia. He's raising up people. He's raising up leaders. And he goes and helps them, gets them on course to to guide those nations. You you know, it's so good when John Mofimbo comes from Tanzania. He says, Dad, every time he writes me a little note, Dad is on there. And I was just with him out in Colorado. Jan and Cleaver with him now. I said, John, it's time to start that Bible school. Jan's coming with you. She's got the stuff. She's going to get it going, man. So 
we've got to be fathers to these people of the nations. Are, are you hearing me? It's our time now. It's our time to make a difference. Bringing them the truth. Bringing them the truth. I'm here to say this, and we're, we're, we're finished. But I'm here to say to you, you have been called to father others. But you say, I'm a woman. You mother them then. Come on. But it, it's this Father's Day. Come on. It, it's time. Be raised up. Lift up. Rick, he's got these kids in the park that he has basketball teams in the park, and he's been fathering these kids. Dealing with all their stuff, man. It's rough, rough lives for a lot of these people. So he bought pizzas for them. Man, it, whatever you can get them to do to come in, man, to hear the word. Pizza, is that all I got to do to get these kids to show up? Come on. <laughs> Father, I just pray right now that the heart of the Father, which is on the inside of each one of us, even the women, Father, help that flow through us to other people. This nation is looking for fathers like never before, God. So I pray that they be raised up. Yes. I pray they be raised up. I pray the gifts, the callings, the talents you have given them, God, are manifesting. The love of the Father flow through us. We got a lot of, of people here, men and women here, and you never really had the love of the Father. You never really had a father hug you and love you and tell you you're important to me. I just feel like God is saying to you right now, daughters, sons, you're important to me. You're valuable to me. I want to I wanna not only hug you, but I want to put that, I want you to know the robe of righteousness is on you. Rings on your finger. Shoes are on your feet. You're going to walk. You're royalty. Ooh, I, I just want you to just meditate on that. You just see yourself as royalty right now in the name of Jesus. There's been some people you've gone through hard things, and it's every day they try to bring those hard things up, saying, look, 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 this is who you really are. No! You are the father's son and daughter right now in the name of Jesus. Mm, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, thank you, Father. You know, to, to people listening to this, right now, if you're listening to this and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, now's your time. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. Forgive me, Lord. Come in and make me righteous, Lord. Make me your son or your daughter. We're just praying that all over, wherever this is being seen. Come in, make me your son and your daughter. Father, I thank you for these people receiving you and being filled with your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.